Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast as we just talked about the headliner games of LSU versus USC and Notre Dame versus Texas A&M. But of course, so much more action that we have to dive into. So we're going to be just looking across the country as to what some of those big results were. And I want to start with the, the, of course, noon game that a lot of people thought could be one of those headliner type games as well, but obviously did not turn out to be that way as Georgia versus Clemson got really ugly really fast. Now, this was a 6 nothing game at halftime, so I don't want to make it out to be that Georgia start to finish just you know cleaned up on Clemson because that was not the case. Clemson's, Clemson still does have a very nice defense, and... There were, you know, some things to feel optimistic about moving forward with Clemson, I suppose, from a defensive perspective. Uh, Number 11, the defensive tackle, Peter Woods. He was sort of all over the place making plays for them and somebody that they obviously, Clemson, a program that really fixates on the idea of of development within house and all of those things that, you know, that's something that they should feel good about. But that being said, should start to further consider this idea. And I don't want to harp on it too much because everybody already is, but the idea of whether or not it is harming, how much it is harming Clemson, their lack of using the transfer portal, because it definitely definitely um, made a difference in this game. And to be fair, Georgia isn't a team that is very transfer reliant either. They're a sort of proud program in terms of doing it a little bit more the traditional way of high school recruiting, developing within all that, which is 100% fair. Um, and But that being said, sometimes you just need a little bit of an extra push and just allocating some of your attention to the transfer portal can be worthwhile, which was shown in this game where Logan Humphreys, uh, a transfer from Vanderbilt, I believe it was, one of 11 transfers for Georgia, ended up having a pretty impactful game where he scored a 40-yard touchdown, ultimately 63 yards. It's not like he had anything crazy, but, you know, two two big-time catches for Georgia that sort of helped ignite the offense a little bit. And ultimately, Georgia's offense, again, it was a slow start. And that, I thought that Carson Beck was just a step off early on. And, you know, ultimately, good, really good stats for Beck as a whole, 22 of 33, 278 yards, two touchdowns. So, you feel pretty good about what Beck gives. You just know that he can also give you more. Also, for whatever it's worth, Georgia missing their top two running backs in this game. Nate Frazier did play pretty well for them. 83 yards and a touchdown for him. So showing a little bit of depth slash somebody who could be next up for the Georgia Bulldogs. But they should uh, get their starters back uh, within the next couple weeks. And ultimately... I think that we're really going to start to see Georgia, if we haven't already, with a 34-3 win against a, a good program in Clemson, but you know, really show that they are deserving of that number one spot, which I would most certainly agree with. As for Clemson here, again, I don't want to bury him too much because I'm sure all of the overreactions this week are going to be about how Clemson is no longer the Clemson they were in the mid-2010s, which they are not that, 100%. It's just a matter of, are they dead or are they having a little bit of an identity crisis? And I don't think that I'm fully ready to bury them. They needed, needed Cade Klubnik to sort of take that next step if they were ever going to be competitive in this game and he he really struggled 18 of 29 142 yards one interception was struggling with the he was struggling with accuracy all day and I think that that's just an issue that they're going to have to correct the lack of you know I mean they do actually have some decent weapons in Antonio Williams and Jake Brenningstool so it's not like they have nothing 100% need better quarterback play though and 
Um, ultimately, again, the defense could only hold off Georgia so long without any sort of help on their own. But the ACC would have been basically entirely written for dead by a lot of the overreactionists if it weren't for the fact that Miami came through in a huge way in their game against Florida to be able to, again, not hold off the entire the ACC is dead arguments because... They went in and they absolutely dominated Florida. And that was sort of, you know, overreactions wise. We can tend to bury teams earlier. We can, you know, also anoint teams too early. That being said, I think that Florida was under the radar already headed into this season. That 19 was disrespectfully low. And you're playing, you're playing Florida who is thought to be taking steps in the right direction as a program, but still we know, you know, not one of those elite SEC programs, but the ACC also saw Virginia Tech lose to Vanderbilt, where Vanderbilt was projected to be last in the SEC, Virginia Tech fourth in the preseason polls in the ACC. So, you know, obviously they were going to need a big win no matter who it was against an out-of-conference opponent, which I know those conversations can be sort of picked off a little bit in an unfair way. But, I I mean, I wish I had put money on this game because two and a half from the jump seemed like that was not giving Miami enough credit, and they just ran away with it with Cam Ward really impressing somebody that, was very, very good at Washington State last year, was in that Heisman candidacy for a while, and I just don't know if the casual college football fan was really keeping up with everything that Cam Ward was doing because he's special and he's just got all the swagger to him where you see him drop back and he just looks so cool, calm, and collected. I think the word that they used on the broadcast for him was nonchalant, and it was so accurate where... You know, then he's scrambling, he's breaking off deceptively quick, just like a skinnier, little bit of a lankier guy. I didn't expect him to, you know, so even myself, maybe I was underrating him, but I didn't expect him to move the way that he did, and it's not like he only had three rush attempts, but, you know, he was effective on them, and he was just sort of coasting out of bounds, talking a little bit of smack. The throw that he, the touchdown throw that he had towards the end of the first half, rolling to his left and then finding um, finding a man in the back of the end zone. It was Jacoby George in the back of the end zone, throwing across his body. It was so impressive, and this is why I picked Miami to come out of the ACC. Now, obviously, can't get too carried away with all of this excitement. Um, this is a Florida team that now you look on the other side and there could be some jobs that are a little bit, um, on the hot seat a little bit where now you look at the way that this sort of played out and with Billy Napier, could he be on the hot seat this season? It's definitely a conversation now. So ultimately this was a very convincing performance from Miami and, uh, again, a team that I have a lot of confidence in moving forward with this season. I don't think that this was just a fluke, but what an introduction for Cam Ward and this Miami offense. By the way, just also give Xavier Restrepo some credit as well for what was one of the cleanest spin moves I feel like I've seen like actually in a game used to perfection. Had two Florida Gators defenders running into each other and he ends up breaking it off he had a huge game seven receptions 112 yards one touchdown so wanted to give him a little bit of love as well but um a couple other notes here we'll go to the big 10 penn state with a very convincing win as well i know we just talked about notre dame and miami to be fair is another one of those teams even going back to last year that can get some some hype and some expectations through the first couple weeks and then ultimately fall short. Penn State is probably one of those programs as well that feel a little bit off about them. But that being said, I mean, I thought that was as convincing of a win as they really could have asked for in week one going into West Virginia's territory and being able to pull out that game, especially with some of the uh, adversity in terms of the weather delay, two-hour weather delay at halftime, honestly might have favored 
Penn State, to be fair, and take the crowd out of it a little bit. But, I mean, either way, that was not an easy win for Penn State. Or it shouldn't have been. They just made it that way. And they did so by, sure, dominating the offensive line, great defense. Those are sort of the the expecteds. But it was the introduction of Andy Kotelnecki's deep game and Drew Aller being able to show out a little bit more for whatever it's worth. It's not like he was asked to throw a ton of passes or, you know, have an incredibly high volume of passes where he only threw 17 passes, 11 of 17, 216 yards, three touchdowns. He was excellent for when he was in. This is somebody that a lot of people sort of abandoned last year as well because of the struggles with Penn State's offense, but there is more of, I mean, some of the, again, Andy Kotelnecki, he is somebody with a reputation to, you know, be able to dial up some more things downfield. Looks like Harrison Wallace could emerge as a true number one target, five catches, 117 yards, two touchdowns in this game. And then the fact as well, obviously this is mostly about the passing for Penn State, but Nicholas Singleton as well, after a disappointing sophomore season, Opens up with against a pretty good defense in West Virginia. 13 carries, 114 yards, and a touchdown. So I thought that overall Penn State was very impressive. And I'm not going to allow myself to, you know, fully, fully plant my flag on, you know, Penn State's going to surprise people this year. But they definitely have a chance to be a lot better. And I know people are going to be sketched out about it because of the fact that it is Penn State and they have fallen short offensively in years past, but I thought it was a very impressive performance. And then the last couple notes here, Oregon and Michigan, both teams a little bit closer calls than they were anticipating early on. Oregon wins 24-14 to against Idaho. This was a three-point game in the fourth quarter, which was absolutely crazy. I think that you know, a lot of people are trying to pin this on Dylan Gabriel, and and at least online I saw people trying to pin it on Gabriel, say, oh, well, you guys overhyped him so much during the during the offseason. I thought G- Dylan Gabriel was excellent in this game, and obviously, you know, you go into... And, and the box, box scores can often be deceiving when you see big stats and ultimately not that many points, but... That wasn't the case for Dylan Gabriel, where I thought he was incredibly accurate. Decision-making was great all game long, but penalties definitely got in the way of some of Oregon's drives. And, you know, they just kind of kept shooting themselves in the foot on a lot of these. But friggin', Dylan Gabriel, 41 of 49, 380 yards and two touchdowns. He was very, very impressive to me. And... I'm not worried about Oregon, really. Um, I think they'll be able to. They just have some stuff to clean up. They are far from the only team that has some stuff to clean up in terms of penalties and execution and stuff like that. But I think they're going to be fine. And then Michigan, who we're going to come back around to later in the show as well, they ultimately win by 20 points in this game. It was close for a lot of it ultimately it took a will johnson pick six with a few minutes left in the fourth quarter to really put a dagger on this game but a lot of conversations in terms of the quarterback controversy they pull a little bit of a surprise i think it was a surprise to me i think that it was surprise to a lot of people the fact that Alex Orgy did not end up being the starting quarterback for them. Instead, they decided to go with Davis Warren. Orgy, I mean, it was such a surprise that the broadcast crew, when they put the starting lineups up, they had Alex Orgy as the quarterback. Instead, it was Warren who won over the who won the job during training camp. We saw some of the shortcomings in limited attempts from Orgy as a passer, but that's something that we're going to, again, talk at, um, a little bit more about at the end of the show. But for now, uh, we are going to be taking a quick break, and when we come back on the other side, I want to talk about some of the performances of younger quarterbacks making their first starts in college football this past weekend and about what the future of the 
position and of the sport ultimately look like. So we are going to be diving into that. But first, a quick break. Do not go anywhere. We will be right back. 